Good evening. Welcome to the National Capital Area Chapter of the American Planning Association Annual Voices Panel event. This topic for tonight's session is equity in planning departments in academia. I am Don Ziegler, the Vice President of Diversity and Outreach for the chapter and your host this evening. Before we begin, we have a few chapter announcements. The National Capital Area Chapter of the APA represents public and private sector planners, planning, planning academics and students, elected officials and, cit and citizen planners in Washington, DC, and Montgomery County, Prince George's County, Maryland. To find, uh, to find out more about the National Capital Area Chapter, please visit ncac.planning.org, where you can find other upcoming events, AICP certification information, job postings, and future conference events. The chapter is hosting a webinar tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern titled, We Just Want to Play, Examining Teens in Public Space. We would like to encourage you to register for the virtual National Planning Conference, conf conference which will take place on May 5th through May 7th. Valerie Jarrett, former Chicago Planning Commissioner and former Senior Advisor to President Obama will be the keynote speaker. For more information, visit planning.org. The National Capital Area Chapter would like to thank our co-sponsors of this event, which include the Maryland APA, the Utah APA, the Planning and the Black Community Division of the APA, and Latinos and Planning Division of the APA. Now on to our voices panel. Uh, tonight, we have some very special guests this evening. We've invited professors and, prof uh, and planners from a variety, for a variety of backgrounds to speak about equity in planning departments in academia. Uh, these thought leaders have written, researched, or engaged the community about equity and planning. Now it is my pleasure to introduce these panelists. Dr. Iris Garcia is a professor at the University of Utah in city and metropolitan planning. Her work addresses uh, the problems of une uneven development as well as grassroots organizing and community development. Monica Tibbetts-Nutt is the executive director of 128 Business Council serves on the Massachusetts Department of Transportation Board of Directors, and is the Vice President of the Nonprofit Youth Engagement Planning, or YEP, which brings planning and community advocacy into K through 12 environments. Dr. Tonya Sanders is an Associate Professor in the City and Region Planning Department at Morgan State University. Her research examines community revitalization through the venue of faith-based organizations. Brittany Drakeford is the special assistant to the director of Prince George's County Planning Department, where she leads the department's health and racial equity task force. She is also a PhD student and in, in the urban and region planning and design program at the University of Maryland. Tonight's moderator is Dr. Hazel Edwards. Dr. Edwards has had a unique career that combines place-based research with planning and urban design teaching and practice. Dr. Edwards is, is an author, professor, a fellow to the American Institute of Certified Planners, and the chair of the Department of Architecture at Howard University. Uh, once again, I'm your host, Don Ziegler, and currently serve as the VP of Diversity and Outreach, and I'm also a long-range planner with the Anne Arundel Office of Planning and Zoning. Uh, tonight, we'll have, our panels, uh, uh, we'll have our panel discussion for about 15 minutes, uh, followed by 15 minutes of Q&A, uh, where we'll take questions from the audience. Uh, please send your, uh, your questions through the chat box at any point during the session. Uh, without further ado, I would like to turn to Dr. Edwards um, to begin our panel discussion. Uh, panelists, please turn on your cameras and microphones. Thank you, Don, and uh, welcome every, everybody to this evening's conversation. Um, we're gonna have a series of topics uh, and then a few questions, and then we'll, uh, as Don said, we'll turn it over to, to Q&A afterwards. Uh, so first, we're gonna cover the topic of re-examining traditional planning paradigms. And so let's discuss how we remold basic planning principles to address planning's role in housing segregation, specifically redlining and the exclusionary history of single family dwelling only zones. 
So first question, and anybody is welcome to jump in uh, and answer these questions. Uh, first question, how do we readjust race neutral foundational planning theories in academia and within planning departments now that a greater light has shown that zoning and land use has a long history in housing segregation? Okay, I, I guess I'll start. Um, really, as planning educators, we need to educate ourselves about these topics so that we feel more comfortable um, talking about them and then challenging these neutral theories and policies um, in our classrooms. Uh, I remember um, the late Dr. Gills, one of the things that he taught us is always to you know, talk about or think about who benefits from these policies, who loses, and are the burdens and benefits equally distributed across the population. And so for us as planning educators, we really do need to challenge these theories and policies in our classrooms uh, just to begin to demantle it. Thank you. Yeah, I would certainly agree. And I would say, you know, one of the, the first things that we would have to, to consider, I mean, from a practitioner perspective, is actually starting to do some of that research. So um, we, and right now there is this, we are in the middle of a racial reckoning in the United States and, and perhaps even globally. And so there are all of these conversations that are happening uh, in some media outlets, in certain spheres, I'm on Twitter. And I think every single day, there are all of these conversations about you know, the conversation about redlining, conversations around restrictive deed covenants. But the reality is for so many different planning institutions and planning agencies at the local level, they're not always getting that information, right? And so there are some organizations and some institutions who may have still not necessarily heard about the impacts of redlining. So if we talk about redlining and the relationship between redlining and altitudinal segregation, as Barney and Worf described, where African-Americans tend to live at lower lying levels, and when we talk about climate change and the impacts of that, or the impacts of uh, tree canopy coverage and the, uh, the historic vestiges of segregation, some of those conversations at the practicing level aren't necessarily happening as, quick as, as quickly as they are at the um, at the academic level. And so I think one of the things that we can really do in really trying to build the bridge between academia and the a planning profession is really first building stronger partnerships between local universities and anchor institutions where they are conducting some of this research and, and being willing to share that information to some of our local planning agencies. Additionally, some other tools that we can use is just by at the local level starting to do that research. Yeah. So where did residential segregation for instance, exist in Prince George's County. How did it how did it create itself or what did it look like? How did it replicate? Was it redlining? And so in a community like Prince George's County, we did not necessarily see redlining as much or through the traditional um, HLLC maps, but we saw it more so through like restrictive deed covenants or perhaps racial zoning. And so really doing a little bit more deeper diving to really see, one, to acknowledge that segregation, segregation existed and then also what are some of the ways that it existed in our communities. And, and just to piggyback on that, um, I was in another conversation where we're talking about, well, what do you do after you are out of school? Because everyone, depending on which school you went to, you may have had more of a robust exposure to these kinds of topics. And so um, these people happen to be architects we were, I was talking to, but they were saying the things that they were doing at their firm. And, and one was really like a book club. And so that they would then read a book about the topic, you know, whatever specific one it may be, and then having conversations and also maintaining that, you know, this is a safe space because again, people have had different levels of exposure and you're not gonna jump down somebody's throat necessarily because they haven't had the level of exposure that you've had. But those types of conversations, uh, particularly at the firm level, that's helping to um, change the way in which people are, are designing for um, communities, particularly communities of color. I wanted to add um, that uh, learning from different places is very important um, nationally because um, redlining manifests itself um, different, you know, just depending on, on the geography. And um, again, it affects what we see today 
um, and we are in a housing crisis. So people, I don't think that these topics are no, not new by any means. It's just that people are more interested because now we have uh, more of a movement um, uh, towards like uh, fighting for uh, anti-racism, but at the same time, we're experiencing a, a housing bubble, right? Um, in a way, or should we should say uh, housing inflation. Um, yeah, and yeah. I think that also at the same time, we have to move forward. So I am teaching like a class that is like with multiple campuses. Uh, so it's like UCLA, Penn, University um, of Arizona, UIUC. So there's like um, about like 12 campuses. And the idea is like how we learn from all these different spaces and how we also learn um, from, from each other um, because uh, different professors also have different experiences, right? And they have like particular live experiences that they can also share um, in the classroom. And we have been trying to um, reframe instead of like talking about um, ju just um, zoning and um, again, redlining. It's like how we zone for equity, how we move like forward in this um, conversation. So I think that that's like very, very important. I think the conversations, I feel like that's a theme that keeps coming back. As a transportation planner and a transportation official um, here in Massachusetts, we have a very, very segregated region. It always has been this way. It, it continues to be this way. And it plays out in our housing, our education, and it really plays out in our transportation. And so I think some of the things I really pursue are looking at kind of a harm reductive service planning and really bringing in, I think, especially a lot of the research from the social sciences to have a greater understanding of not only the history of the transportation decisions we made, but how do we try and avoid them going into the future? And so for us here in Massachusetts, we have a couple of different wrinkles. In addition to a significant amount of segregation, we don't have county government structures. So when we deal with this, we have to go municipality by municipality. And for some of them, you know, median home prices are $1.2 million. And so that's just kind of the stuff we're having to deal with. And especially for the legacy we have here of the big dig, which, you know, multi-billion dollar project, something we're very well known for, things that most people don't know is it destroyed almost every community of color that it came near. And so I think as we're building these rail projects, et cetera, we have to recognize that history, but also look at the land use, look at the zoning. How do we build in protections for a full spectrum of housing in that land use decision? So when we're doing mobility oriented development or transportation oriented development, we're building good communities. We're not just building good isolated projects. Well, thank you all. I just wanted to add that we need more documentation of, uh, of these issues. And I think that um, June Manning Thomas and Marsha Riz Rizdoff's edited piece, uh, Urban Planning and the African-American Community in the Shadows, um, that was published in 1996. And there've been other uh, books and, and certainly articles since then, but, I know when I was teaching, when I started teaching um, at Morgan State in the planning program in 99, that their book was just really um, kind of eye-opening in terms of planning history and what I was able to convey to my students. Okay, so let's go on to question two. How do you reframe planning education that often leaves out the contributors of black and brown community planners and organizers? Who wants to start? Right, I, don't okay. I don't mind starting this out. Um, I was kind of thinking about this question earlier, but really like at the ground level. So, you know, I'm talking about like in the immediacy, like we as planning educators and not just BIPOC planning educators, but all planning educators uh, really do need to expose our students to black and brown planners and community organizers. Now, and today, like just like we're doing right now, you can do things with Zoom particularly if they're living legends, um, as compared to like historical figures, it's possible to really just invite them to the classroom. And, and this is like low, low bar, low cost to, again, just get that conversation started by exposing our students to them. 
I will say that um, one of the issues is that um, we tend to use a lot of like journals that are only in planning. And I think that we have to move um, to look into other places. A lot of um, people of color might publish um, in things in African studies or Latin American studies and other areas. Um, so and that might have something to do with like um, maybe their work have been like rejected in some of these like main um, planning journals or there's some things that they might not talk about or they're trying to contribute to their community and then um, writing in some other spaces. Um, so we need to start um, acknowledging that not all the planning literature is um, inside of what we consider planning literature and just like move um, to those like other um, spaces. And I think that we also have to educate um, others about um, those like readings. And mm -hmm. a lot of people are not aware. And there's a lot of efforts, like um, for example, in the Committee of Diversity, in um, the Association of, of Collegiate Schools of Planning that have put together syllabus that are trying to talk about diversity and social justice. And there's lists that people have put together um, and it's like obviously great to look at that, but a lot of people don't even know <laughs> that it exists. Um, yeah. So we again have to do that education um, work. And as academics, we also need to uh, analyze, you know, um, where we can incorporate some of those like um, readings. Um, but a lot of work needs to be done um, structurally, but also in terms of like education. Yeah. Yeah, and, and just to pick up on uh, what uh, Dr. Edwards had said earlier, we need to do a good job of writing about these individuals and memorializing them across, you know, different types of media. So, you know, that we can share them not only with our current students, but also future generations. Yeah, um, I mean, I think thinking about, so there are two things that I wanna add, but I wanted to also just pick up on the point around, you know, the documentation. So a lot of my research is focused where I try to perform my research from like the black radical feminist tradition and then also incorporating concepts around critical race theory. And so that means what are the ways in which, for me, what are the ways in which African-Americans engage with, uh, with history? And so that is very much documented through oral histories and very much documented through music. So I think if we really wanna think about how we can start to recenter race neutral foundational planning theories, I mean, one of that just centers around how do we rethink like what is knowledge? And is knowledge only coming from a written document or if, and because I'm from Prince George's County, I'm gonna reference go-go music, right? Or if I listen to like Trouble Funk's uh, The Word, which goes over this, basically this historical analysis and this literary analysis of like the Reagan era and the impacts of, um, of you know, of uh, defunding of the federal government, how that has impacted farmers. Literally, the song talks about how it's impacted farmers, how it's impacted uh, food, food benefit programs, all college colleges, all of these other aspects. How might I be able to bring that into my, uh, like my planning or community development course to get students not just to think about students and planners, not just to think about traditional concepts of knowledge or traditional concepts of knowledge, but other ways in which communities engage in knowledge every single day. I mean, some things that I will also add to reframing this is how do we rethink about what is city planning or urban planning? Uh, so Delane Chan in a City Lab wrote a really great article that, that talks about what counts as real city planning. So what is planning? And starting with that framework with communities about, or our, our communities, whether they be planning uh, professionals or uh, planning students about really interrogating this idea about what is planning. And if we start to interrogate this concept of what is planning and planning more so just being a process of planning for, or, or organizing for a future state or a future outcome, we can start to reevaluate who actually consists of as a plan, who we actually consist of or consider to be planners. The, the second or third thing with that is also then to interrogate why we had communities who had to plan for themselves in the first place. So we have to really wrestle with this idea of these historical legacies that um, you know, as Andrea, uh, I believe Andrea Roberts, Dr. Roberts out of Texas uh, wrestles with, with these concepts of freedom colonies. And the fact that we have freedom colonies is because the local government chose not to work with 
historically black and brown communities, so they had to develop their own spaces. And so really wrestling with this idea that historically, our, whether it be our, our federal government, our local government devalued people and we did not value them as people. And because of that devaluation, we also still are not necessarily valuing who they are in the present. We see that through the, uh, like the, the lack of funding in certain communities, or we see that through the increased funding of police, police forces in, in certain communities, right? And so how do we start to really challenge who we value in our society? And if we start to challenge that idea, then we can start to bring in new concepts of who actually counts as planners and really start to value that work um, in other ways as well. Monica, did you wanna add anything? I, I think everyone covered. I mean, the only thing I wanna say is, you know, I think for those of us out in the field, and especially as we have people who are kind of mid and later in their career, the continuing education is really, really important. And I think we've had to look outside of the field of planning for a lot of this continuing education, I think, especially as we are tackling so many of the issues that we have within our communities. And so I think having more options, having more, I think, updated material for continuing education, I think would be amazing because, I mean, as everyone knows, if you just follow the rubric, it's pretty much the same thing every single time. And they're, they're really quite outdated. They really are. And so I think, like you said, I think Ivis really kind of that multidisciplinary and really seeking out research from other sectors. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, thank you. Let's move on to the second topic, which is challenges. And so let's discuss how to increase the number of black and brown planning students and professors within universities and increase the number of black and brown planners within planning departments. Who wants to start? Um, I would actually like to start with this because one of the things, like I said, that we struggle with is the training once planners come out of graduate school. So what we've actually done time, spent a lot of time with is educating young people. As, as he mentioned, I'm the Vice President of Youth Engagement and Planning, and really what this is about is educating youth on the language, on the systems, on how these decisions are being made so that they can be more proactive in the process. And we've worked with kids from five all the way up to 26 across the country on many different issues, whether it's dealing with homeless youth, whether it's dealing with youth who you know, are recent immigrants, really exposing students to that, but at the same time training our planners on how to talk to youth, because that's just another way that they're gonna see, oh, I can be a black planner. Oh, this is the kind of stuff that they get to do. If I wanna make my community better, this is a way that I can do this. So I think exposing children at a younger age, because I think so many of us did not know what planning was until we were undergrads. And by then it can be really difficult for a lot of students to really understand the things that they need to do to kind of continue to go that path. And just to pick up on that thread, I would say, um, developing pipelines with HBCUs and with community colleges, because we know that many of our students, they, they might begin at a community college. And so having um, universities intentionally, you know, developing MOUs with community colleges or HBCUs, that can help to increase um, uh, people of color in the planning programs. Do you think that um, in terms of admissions, it's like um, very important, um, as Tanya said, to like um, create those relationships um, with like um, just other universities, um, including community colleges. So I will say um, that creating a way um, to make that connection, but also creating like dual degrees um, or connections with like ethnic studies, um, African-American studies. Personally, I, when I came to planning, I first was attracted by the, the dual degree in Latin American studies. And I felt very welcome all the way throughout my program um, because there was like that connection and those classes and curriculum that it was like explicitly um, anti-racist and it really integrated everything for me um, in, in planning. Um, the other things is in terms of admissions that might be um, important is like obviously giving scholarships 
um, for students um, so that they have to like um, have like a work outside, they can work um, inside the, the department. Um, and uh, I think that right now, um, there's many programs that are like waiving GRE because um, they have people have not been able to take the exam. Um, but it is like a barrier for people that um, might not have like the money to be um, applying to studying for the exam and doing well and then um, um, actually like taking it maybe several times. Um, and the same thing with like um, the fees for admissions, um, students like they tend to apply to several programs. And those are some things that could be um, waived as well. So we should think about what are some of the ways um, of reducing that um, burden and encouraging um, diverse uh, people to actually apply uh, to the program. And then once the students are there, student retention is like very important. Um, scholarships are part of that, but um, also like having like mentoring um, and connecting students with like planners and alumni. That's one of the things that I hear the most because um, that social capital is very necessary. And uh, for a lot of people, especially if they were like um, first generation college students, so they might not have that um, those connections to city or all these different places, um, they need to be connected, right? Um, and those, those are some of the ways that we can um, make sure that not only they come to school, but they also stay in school. Jennifer, oh, uh, Renee, do you wanna go? Yeah, I would, I would just add the, the idea of also, and, and Ivis, I think you've touched on this as, as well, is really also providing some type of support and resources for, uh, for students of color once they're in school. So um, last semester, I attempted, uh, and we, we basically, I'm not, I won't say attempted, but we, we did it. Uh, we started uh, like a, a, a black student affinity group at um, the University of Maryland um, for our students in the urban planning, well, urban planning, architecture, um, historic preservation and real estate development program. The challenge was that it's very difficult to get a program like that going when you have very, very few students of color already there. So it's, if, if two people don't show up, then you're, you're left with like two other people. And so how do we find, I mean, at the university level, how do we help students at least um, helping them with some of that capacity building and setting up some of that institutionalization of certain key elements initially, if we're trying to start a form and affinity group, what might be some initial help that we might need um, in starting that? And then once we get it rolling, those students can start to make those connections and serve as ambassadors. But once they're, but when you're, and I see in the chat box, there's some students who have talked about, you know, some of the stresses of being the only black planner in their grad program. And so not having that, that other, that social support makes you feel isolated. And then you don't really feel encouraging or you don't feel the, the energy to wanna to go out and serve as an ambassador because your experience is very isolating. And why would you want anyone else to have to endure a similar experience? Mm -hmm. If I could just, just build off of what actually both of you all just said, I think it's really important to make sure that we have those built in support. So, it, and, and I hear what you're talking about, like maybe a starting an affinity group or something on the side, but even that can be taxing. So if, if the programs can structure themselves so that when students come in, they're immediately connected to a faculty mentor, when students come in, you know, these things are already lined up for them. So they don't necessarily have to take on the extra burden of having to start a, a, you know, something on the side just so that they can get the support that they need. So having those supports built in and um, particularly with Eva said about the scholarships, many of our students work and if they are working, um, and again, it could be a job that's outside of planning, they're not necessarily getting that exposure to the various types of planning that there is. And so if we can offer them scholarships, that, that means that it takes a little bit of a load off of them and they can spend more time engaging in, you know, doing the internships and, um, you know, doing, you know, being on um, research teams and things like that that would expose them to many different types of planning and that would then make them more marketable. So that's one, you know, we're able to get people in, but we need to make sure that as Evie was talking about retention and we're able to support them as, as they go through the program and then obviously to get a job afterwards. Mm -hmm. So we focused a lot on students. Let's shift to professors 
uh, planning professors, uh, black and brown planning professors. Um, and one of my, I left, uh, I, I came to Howard University uh, to the Department of Architecture in 2016. So my last Association of Collegiate Schools of Planning Conference, I remember being at a session about diversity and planning in the Planning Academy. And um, one of the questions that just kept uh, coming up was, or one of the issues rather, was that so many um, African-Americans and people of color in general were coming out of doctoral programs and planning, getting on tenure tracks, but then by the time it was, they were ready to go up for tenure, suddenly something changed and they weren't able to get tenure. And so um, my position was that if we can't get people tenured, we can't get people into leadership positions, associate professors, uh, full professors, and I believe that you should not be a department chair, program chair, unless you have the cover of tenure, whatever that means. And so um, how do you think that things have changed? Um, are they getting any better? Or I haven't looked at the representation across the programs, but how do you think things have changed or have, have they changed at all? I, I think that there's like several um, initiatives like through ACSB. Mm -hmm. So there's like a junior um, faculty workshop in where um, the faculty are, um, are connected um, from their first or second year. Um, and then there's like um, several opportunities that exist, um, particularly through the Planners of Color um, interest um, group. So this is something that it's um, it has assisted for a while, but now I think it's like really strong. Um, so we have like um, professors um, that actually one of them was like um, now just uh, obtained tenure and now they're becoming mentors, right? Um, mm -hmm. Like in a way, Tonya is part of that, <laughs> right? Um, so. Um, I think that that's like a, a way of like moving forward, but like, uh, so it's like supporting each other and creating more of a national network. Um, but um, in terms of like the support that they get at the institutions and mentorships on the institution, I would say is very minimal because I have heard uh, too much about it. <laughs> um, and I know that that really, that part is not, is not happening. Any other comments before we move on? Um, one of the things that I would just add is when we're talking about creating more faculty of color, sometimes we need to increase the number of faculty lines. But in many of our programs, particularly here at Morgan, um, whole departments are being covered by, you know, less than five individuals. So you know, every hire is so critical to make sure that they are, you know, represent the wide diversity of, you know, of racial groups and, and, and ethnicity. So yeah, sometimes finding ways to increase the number of faculty is important, but I mean, as you all know, that's also tied to enrollments as well, because any talk with the provost about increasing faculty lines, the first thing she's going to say is, well, what, what's the enrollment numbers? Mm -hmm. um, Yes, very, very true. Um, before we move on, uh, one other question under this topic of challenges. Um, what, what are the challenges for increasing the diversity of planning departments and planning management positions? Any thoughts on that question? I mean, I think, I think it also goes back to what everyone on here has said is there just aren't that many diverse planning candidates coming out of school, out of planning programs. And so I think what we've had to do is start pulling people from different disciplines. Mm -hmm. And I think really changing, I think Brittany, you talked a little bit about this in the beginning, really changing what our definition of a planner is. Mm -hmm. Because I mean, I think for a lot of us, it's like, oh, we go to planning school and then we get an ICP and now we're planners. But I think a lot of other people can actually do this work. And so I think for us, it's been pulling from the community. And then I think as far as moving people into more management roles, it's incredibly hard. Um, at our transit agency, we have 7,000 employees and, you know, towards the bottom, you have 60 
percent plus that are women that are people of color and then as you keep rising it gets less and less and so i think for us trying to find internal programs that employees can sign up for it that has a very mm. clear path not this kind of like oh we want to look internally but have an actual structure for how you would do that and then keep reaching out to other disciplines social work taking people from housing, community development people. I think that's been really good for us is just going out and being like, hi, you're a young professional. Have you thought about being a planner? But I think one of the things that we keep running up against is they can't get AICP. And it is very, very difficult for them to pursue really much at all with APA if you do not have that very standard background. And so I think for me, I think someone had mentioned this about the AICP. I think having a different definition for what is a planner and who can sit for that certification mm -hmm. is essential. Because I think if we don't, it is impossible to increase our diversity. We just don't have enough students coming out. And quite honestly, I don't think that should be the only path for planners. But until we really rethink that, I think we're going to continue to struggle with getting enough people who are representative of the communities that we're working in. Yeah, I mean, I would certainly agree. I mean, my path to planning was definitely a roundabout path. Um, I started in undergrad, in undergrad, and I know we'll talk about the role of HBCU, so Aggie Pride, if there are any Aggies on the call. Uh, but I started as a journalism major. And so, and that's what I focused on in undergrad. And then um, I had a, a, a double major in African-American studies. And then I transitioned to, to grad school and I studied business management. So it was definitely not the traditional urban planning path, but if I actually looked at all the content that I focused on and I studied in school, it was the, the, the focus in the content was of that of an urban planner. Um, and even the internship opportunities that I took while they were not necessarily urban planning or in planning agencies, it's still focused on community development and focused on community engagement, community design, place making, all those other aspects. So I think really broadening that definition of, of, of what is a planner, I think also you know, would be very helpful in, uh, in finding, uh, finding new ways to diversify um, the, the planning departments and planning management positions. And I think, as was also mentioned, finding uh, pipeline programs, whether it be mentorship programs, I think will be very key to help uh, help uh, young professionals navigate through the process to understand, because sometimes it's, it's just understanding the different politics and the dynamics of the local community, um, in addition to understanding some of the technical work and the technical aspects as well. And so having someone who can actually guide you through, through that um, is, is very key. Can I also just add, um, in terms of management and, the, and academia, I don't know at like my school, how you would become a chair of a department or a dean of a school. Do you know what I mean? It, 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 there are no, to my knowledge, any internal um, things like, as Monica was saying, that you would necessarily sign up for to say, hey, I'm really interested in this. Uh, maybe someone, you know, come into me to, to get to that level to become a chair of a department or the dean of a school. So some of those things are definitely needed. And that's where I think um, the Association of Collegiate Schools of Planning plays a role because I think those conversations may happen within that organization and looking across all of the planning programs. But then, you know, if you have an interest in, in becoming a, a leader in, in academia, you know, then talking to your, uh, your dean or whomever is in, in charge. I mean, I think in, in talking to other people, um, you know, I remember when, I don't know whether I had gotten tenure yet at, at Morgan State, but I remember meeting June Manning Thomas and Alma, I can't remember Alma's last name, uh, but you know, they were both full professors and had played you know, major roles in their respective departments and being able to talk to them and understand their journey and then what the suggestions they had for me in terms of, you know, assuming a leadership position. Um, I think in some cases, you know, you don't have departments. And so the, uh, the program coordinator or whatever the title is, uh, that person is a de facto uh, chair, but talking to others who've already walked before you, I think is really important. Uh, so on the next topic, uh, we're gonna talk about uh, the role of historically black colleges and universities. Um, 
what's the, the uh, we're gonna discuss the importance of uh, those HBCUs and how they've uh, contributed to the diversity of planning professors, planning professionals, and the greater impact that they've had on the profession. Uh, so there are four, if I'm not mistaken, there's still only four planning programs at historically black colleges, uh, Morgan State University, of course, Jackson State University, Alabama A&M, and Texas Southern University. So Tanya, do you wanna start with it since you're at uh, an HBC, one of those programs? Yeah, well, first thing, I, I kind of want to recognize the support that HBCUs have been getting, at least from like the federal level. So, mm -hmm. you know, like with the NIH, I know that they have, um, you know, partnerships with minority servant institutions and NSF. I think they have the same, you know, they have some workshops that we get um, invited to, to, to talk about how to submit a grant. Do you know what I'm saying? So I just want to at least acknowledge that at the federal level, there has been some outreach specifically to HBCUs. Um, in terms of supporting ac and academia and like research, kind of one of the things I, I kind of alluded to earlier, you know, at many HBCU, H HBCUs like Morgan, some of it's a capacity issue. So many of our programs, you know, again, enrollment drives the number of faculty lines. So we, we are working with like under five faculty members. So if, if enrollment's kind of driving those numbers, it, it's, and we, are, we have so few faculty members, that means the number of classes are spread across these very few people. So many of my colleagues are teaching like a 4-4. Four, four. So for others, for students who are on this call, um, you know, that means four classes in the spring semester, in the fall semester and four classes in the spring semester, or even a 3-3, three, three, which is not that much better. So even though faculty are able to, you know, get out stellar research, they don't necessarily have the quantity. So you got quality, but the number of projects and things that you're able to do when you're teach, having such a heavy teaching load, you know, you, it, it's just harder to do. So, you know, I think like the Biden administration, I know they just started, but um, I think they're sensitive to the needs of minority serving institutions uh, across the board. But, you know, honestly, states have like over many generations been contributing less and less to universities, all universities, not just HBCUs. And, but HBCUs are very conscious about raising tuition costs because that would prohibit the very students that our mission uh, seeks to educate. So, you know, and, and not to say that everything is about money, but some things really just are. I mean, um, Mackenzie Scott, uh, I, I'm sure we all saw those. And great, I mean, like she gave quite a, few million dollars to uh, several HBCUs across the U.S. And, and Morgan was one of those recipients. So um, we're so grateful. But those types of cash infusions are needed so that we can um, scale up on the, the work that we're already doing and the population that we serve. Thank you. Um, anybody else want to uh, chime in? Okay, uh, Brittany, I wasn't, I'm not sure whether you were reaching for your uh, mute button. <laughs> well, I did have a question. So I know, so at least in Maryland, there was uh, the state legislature recently, I guess, signed off on the $577 million for uh, historically black colleges and universities as a, as a result of some of the, uh, basically the, the long-term underinvestment that the state had put into this, uh, the, the, the HBCUs. So I was wondering, I mean, do you think that, and I guess this is definitely directed to Tonya, do you think that that will have some impact on, you know, the ability for, for research efforts? Oh, specifically for research. Okay, so I know well, President, oh yeah, yeah. So, so President Wilson, um, and, and he's putting together a task force that's really gonna guide us in how we're going to um, invest that money. But one of the things is it has to be an investment. Like if the, the programs that we're able to bring online um, they need to be, I forget the, the term that he uses, but essentially high demand uh, mm. kinds of programs that will eventually be able to sustain themselves because after 10 years, of course, the money from the lawsuit will dry up and those programs will need to be self-sustaining. Um, even with the McKinsey money that we got, um, most of it was put into an endowment. I think some was kept out to 
uh, be seed money for one of the new centers that's going up. But, but the idea, I think, for the McKinsey money is to use that for scholarships for students. Again, we already talked about how important it is to give scholarships to students so that they don't necessarily have to work or at least work less and they can focus more on their education and taking advantage of all opportunities that are in front of them. So, um, yeah, so, but in, in terms of when I was talking about more structural, that's the piece that I, I don't know how like these latest cash infusions will help. Cause I mean, even at the federal level, and actually saying with the Biden administration, with the, um, the PPP, or the, no, no, the CARES Act, not the PPP, CARES Act, that. Um, uh, just passed in the CARES Act too, they gave specific money for HBCUs and minority serving institutions on top of just what everybody else got. And so those one-time cash infusions certainly will help and, you know, push an admission forward. But I, I'm, I'm waiting to see how it's going to translate into like workload. So I do know that they have a task force on workload, uh, faculty workload, and to see how that could be adjusted. But honestly, without bringing on more faculty, I mean, how, how would that work? <laughs> I, mean, I don't know, I just don't know. So I'm just waiting to see, but yeah, those cash infusions will definitely help, but um, we need to think about sustainability over the long run. And it also even makes me just wonder around the, I mean, there's been a lot of talk around the importance of STEM and STEAM, so incorporating mm -hmm. the arts. And I mean, yeah. what does it look like for us to actually say that urban planning is a, st is a STEAM field? Where if we're if we're saying that urban planning is multidisciplinary, it's a transdisciplinary yep. field. We're bringing in you know arts, science, technology, math, engineering. I mean history to a certain to a certain extent. How do we even you know in, in saying like when you say a high demand field, I know a high demand field is probably going to end up being something like this the STEM related fields. But how do we even start to position urban planning, um, urban planning like from that perspective that this is truly a an interdisciplinary field that really is the, the application, like the STEM and STEAM in action um, mm -hmm. as a way to, to reposition um, like the, the attractiveness, uh, maybe whether for, to be for HBCUs or even uh, just other institutions as well. Mm -hmm. um, just, just the thought though, um, you know, like heritage tourism and cultural tourism and, and us guiding places, cities and, and places into you know that realm so that I mean because we know that cultural tourism actually brings in quite a bit of dollars and many um, countries good portions of their whole budget are you know relying on tourism so I think that's one of the I don't say it's emerging because it really is already out there but in terms of uh, planning really inserting ourselves into this like steam um, category in you know looking at the arts and other things, and how tourism can help increase um, the economies of countries and, and, and places, that can be one. Uh, before we move on, just one other question. Um, you know, there, uh, as I mentioned, there are four uh, planning programs at historically black colleges and universities. Uh, all of them are accredited by the planning accreditation board. But how do we how do we produce uh, how, and and they are they are probably uh, the largest producers of uh, of of uh, current and and future planners. But how do we increase the number of those accredited programs at HBCUs? And maybe this ties back to what I think Brittany first. Uh, introduced was, and Tanya, you've, you've said it as well, but, you know, going beyond planning and embracing other disciplines that a university may have. Yeah, so I think of schools like Bowie State, which has a, a really mm -hmm. good, you know, Master's of Public Administration program, mm -hmm. or, yeah. of course, my alma mater, North Carolina A&T, which has a, an awesome engineering program. I mean, what does it look like to, to at least offer, to at least start offering one or two classes with those uh, with those universities that focus mm -hmm. on the built environment, and that could be a a multi um, like a, a across um, across a department program that's offered that looks at where perhaps it's a a collaboration between our you know the journalism program, engineering program, and maybe like the sociology program at a, at a university to offer this uh, you know this uh, cross department uh, class. Um, mm -hmm. I also, I mean, and I'm not as as versed in it, 
But I do also understand that many HBCUs because of funding issues have to start cutting some of their more social sciences program or some of their more, uh, some of their, some of their, uh, some of their social sciences programs. And so, for instance, um, North Carolina A&T at one point had one of the, the, the best agricultural economics programs in the universe, in the, in the country. Um, and they produced the most black agricultural economists in the, in the world. But because of low enrollment in that program and, and probably getting to the, some of the points of having to direct scholarships mm -hmm. and funding in other places, that program had to be dissolved. Now that program today could be a, a great fundamental element for food systems planning, right? Which we're yeah. talking about now with resilience mm -hmm. and yet that program had to, had to dissolve. And so I think some of the challenges with historically black colleges and universities mm -hmm. is this fact of existing and having to operate in the system where your, your graduates historically experienced like job discrimination so they can't give back to the university as much as they would like to give back financially, which means that you might not have as much discretionary spending that you could use to invest in some in some programs that perhaps might actually drive the future or that you might want to invest in. And so I think some of those challenges, um, you know, are present and prevalent for many um, HBCUs, but finding finding ways, whether it be through in, I believe uh, Montgomery County planning has a new partnership. Uh, I believe it's Montgomery County or might be Baltimore City has a, plan, a partnership with Morgan State University and looking at like internship programs. Um, please correct me if that is incorrect. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, um, or, Baltimore you know, City has one, yes. Okay. <laughs> and, so, no, but, yeah. but, and so what does it look like even just to start by, if we know that there are HBCUs in our community, how do we just start by volunteering and uh, doing some pop-up classes with those local universities. Um, mm -hmm. So I apologize, Tina Patterson says it's Baltimore City. <laughs> Baltimore City. Um, can I pick up on a thread though? So when we know that we had more um, planning programs at HBCUs and when we know that they are being threatened, you know, is there something that ACSP could have did or APA could have did to help, I don't know, gird up those programs before they closed? So, I mean, it's, it's, I know it's a question answering your question with the question, but, you know, I'm thinking of like Savannah State, because I don't think their program is there anymore. And, and I think it might have even recently closed. So somebody in the chat, please correct me. But, and I, and I don't know the, the background of, of how the deliberations went before they, um, before they decided to close the program. But I'm just saying like, is it something that ACSP or APA could have done to reach out to that program before it closed to help maybe shore it up? a good question we we and i think um uh what's the north carolina university in greenville uh, i think they have a planning program had one before howard used to have one back in the uh closer in the 90s um but we're running out of time so let me uh let's shift on to the last topic uh and that is successful models let's discuss uh, any current academic programs and planning departments that have done a successful job of addressing diversity, equity, and inclusion. So the first question is, uh, from your past reach or experience, which departments have taken successful concrete steps on an equitable and diverse planning department and or equitable outreach? <sighs> I really want to highlight the work of Baltimore City. Mm -hmm. uh, they've been doing some um, outstanding work there and I've uh, been following them very closely and researching and uh, meeting with their staff because um, in Prince George's County, we're hoping to uh, basically follow in some of the templates that they uh, follow, follow in their footsteps. Um, so they did a great job of doing, um, after the, uh, the, the, the riots following the uh, murder of Fr Freddie Gray, um, they mm -hmm. actually started to do some internal work as a planning agency to start to understand uh, more of the legacies of, of, of urban planning in their community. And that, you know, I believe they ended up uh, partnering with GARE to do some research uh, or to do some, some staff training as well. Um, that led to more um, research initiatives that came out to actually explore some of the differences in the community um, across, across Baltimore. Um, and to the point now where I believe they have developed a um, 
basically like an equity plan and an equity model. Um, and that's also been incorporated with some of their other work around food systems planning um, and health equity as well. So I think Baltimore uh, City is a, is a really great example. Mm -hmm. You know, when I first read that question, um, I, I read it as um, what are planning departments, like academic planning departments doing? Like what are, what are some of the models that they're, they're, they're using towards like outreach um, to make this more equitable? And so like one of the things that I did think of is that um, at Morgan, so we like have a planning advisory committee and I'm sure most universities probably have something similar. And so, you know, they outreach to, you know, professional planners across the board um, and they advise on like curriculum, you know, skill sets that are might be changing in the field so that we can always stay on top of it. Um, they come and they, we have this thing called super jury at the end of the semester. And so professional planners come and they kind of critique our students, um, the work that they've done all year. We even send like our capstones out to them and they'll give us some feedback on it, fundraising partnerships, those types of things. So, um, and in terms of helping to create equity, particularly for Morgan, having those professional planners um, given of their time and resources back to our department, I, I think that does a lot. Yeah, I think that there's um, a lot of like planning departments. I don't want to say specifically which ones, um, but I have been working uh, with the Planners of Color Interest Group and um, we have um, done this like um, survey of students and like some of those um, we have actually like have done it in our own um, departments as well, just to like talk about the climate of diversity like year after year. And um, there, we actually have like a talk with administrators in May to find out which other um, schools want to implement this um, survey um, that again, they will have like a longitudinal study and then we can all share the data and share ideas as well. Cause like what I find a little bit hard is that um, not, all the schools have the same resources to be able to attract um, students of color or faculty of color, especially if they are in a place where there's not a lot of uh, people of color there already. Um, Utah, for example, right? So you can have, we have like wonderful efforts here, but um, at the same time, you know, we, we could do a lot better. Um, and so, so I think that is important to have those conversations and also notice that there's like differences in geography, there's also differences um, that of the faculty of color that are there. Many times they're the ones like driving um, this work. Um, some of the best things I have seen the schools have done is like um, hire a staff member that is like um, actually doing that work on diversity and thinking about inclusion. Um, but again, you need to have the money and the resources to do that. So at the same time, many times I'm not surprised that, you know, private schools or like giant schools that have lots of money <laughs> can like do this um, work a little bit better and attract students and attract also faculty with like better hiring packages. Okay, why don't we um, I think we're running out of time. So um, another question under this topic of successful models is how can the national uh, capital area chapter model any past successful goals or metrics to advise area academic programs and planning departments? Well, I'll, I'll jump out there. Um, one of the things that they have done, and I, I, would, continue, I would encourage them to continue to do um, is helping to support students through the AICP exam. So I know that they offer scholarships. Um, I know I got one when I was uh, going up to do to take the AICP exam. Um, I don't know if you all offer like study classes and things like that, but that'd be great. Um, but even if you were just like a connector, because one of the things I found helpful, particularly for studying for the exam, is that other people in my region who were also studying for the exam, like we develop a study group and then um, within our study group, we were able to say, okay, well, you're gonna look at this piece and you're gonna come back and, and teach the rest of us. And I'll look at this and come back and teach the rest of us. I don't know, it was, it was a really good, just, you know, cohort and support network going through uh, that process. Um, 
but also like I encourage you all to continue doing these types of things. So most schools, most universities particularly have like get, um, speaker series and things like that, that, you know, allow pr particularly practitioners to come back in and talk to students. Um, so it would be great to, you know, continue to pull from the capital area to bring into, you know, like Morgan or, you know, Maryland or any of the other schools. Yeah, the um, APA has also like the ambassadors, um, which is like a way for planners to like volunteer in the community. I would like to see more connections between that and uh, students that are, um, again, just like entering the, the field of um, planning. And uh, also the, the, the APA has a, a foundation um, and is uh, they they give some some grants, but um, if there was like maybe a little bit of encouragement, like we would like to really see these types of applications um, that involve students, right? Because they're like the um, the ones that will be like in the field very soon. <laughs> um, so those those will be like um, great things as well. Monica or uh, Brittany, any thoughts on this? I mean, I would definitely just agree with continuing to provide resources, whether that be, um, even if it's just like a, a speaker bureau of uh, equity-based researchers or equity-based um, uh, 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 researchers or uh, speakers or even uh, uh, consultants that um, surrounding jurisdictions can pull from. Uh, I mean, at Prince George's County, we do, we have a, a, a bi-monthly speaker series. And so we're constantly looking for people to, to bring in, to talk to us about a variety of different planning topics. So if you, if there were or a listing of that information, I think that would be very helpful for us to be able to, to know who to go to and, you know, and to, to know who to go to and know that these people have been vetted, um, you know, by EPA or by the local chapter will also be uh, very helpful. And if I might add, I think that writing can be very powerful as well. I know that um, there's like APA has like blogs and many local chapters have blogs and newsletters. Um, I have had created assignments for my students in where they write <laughs> um, and, you know, have like their voice being heard in that manner. So I think that um, just ed educating and also having planning students that are like engaged with the chapter in an intellectual way as well. Um, I think it's like very important. I agree with you. And um, I think that the local chapters are really important. When I taught at Morgan State, I was, um, I guess, just getting into, it come from practice and I got to know the, the, uh, the people who were part of the Maryland chapter of APA and they would come in. And so my first, one of my teaching assignments was to teach land development law. And I did so kicking and screaming my first year. <laughs> second year, I was like, oh, I had gotten involved with Maryland APA. And so I was meeting people who um, worked at the department, Maryland Department of Natural Resources who dealt with the critical area plan. And they would come in and um, so, you know, I would talk about theory concepts and they would actually talk about applications. And so I think that there, I would like to believe that there are a lot of um, uh, practitioners who want to give back and are willing to take the time, make the time to um, you know, share their knowledge and experiences with, with uh, students and faculty. No, I definitely agree. And I think especially planners who are from un underrepresented groups, I find that they're the ones that are always signing up for the mentorships. They're the ones that are always like, yeah, no, send me all the interns you can. But I do think having the local chapters reach out to those communities of practitioners, because I think for a lot of us, unless you have a mentoring program, you wouldn't know how to get in connection with a university. And, and I think, especially when it's coming to like guest lecturing and things like that, many practitioners would love to share our knowledge. There just aren't as many avenues as we would like, or at least as Brittany pointed out that we are aware of. So um, I, 
Mark and, and uh, Don, I don't know if you are looking at the chat and the Q&A section, but there, uh, why don't we, thank you, you know, the four of you for your, your, your comments. Um, are we ready to talk about uh, what's in the chat or what's in the Q&A section? Open it up sure. to questions. Sure, uh, thank you again to all the panelists. This was great. Um, we'll try to get through some of these questions. We won't get through all of them, um, but we'll try to do the best that we can. Um, uh, so one of the questions, um, one of the first questions we had was, uh, how can planning professionals both in the public and private sectors partner with academia to better uncover, document uh, the past work and work on solutions? That's a really good question, because I think it's something that we have spent a lot more time doing is connecting with many of planning professors. But like I said, really the social sciences, we've spent a lot of time with sociology, especially sociologists who have studied the region that we work in. And I think through some of their teaching, it's been fantastic for us, but then we were also gay, had the ability to show them things that they wouldn't have thought of because so many of our theories, so much of the research we deal with is so incredibly old that a lot of people don't think about the way that those have morphed over time for those who are practicing. Because you take this stuff and it's like, we learned it, but it's not actually applicable. And so then what we need to do is figure out the steps in the field, especially around, like I said, community engagement, community inclusion, and then going back to the academia for this. But I think once again, going back to how do we create these relationships where we can be doing research together? How can we create case studies that are actually working with the people on the ground who are doing a lot of this work? So I think it is once again, trying to find where we have those synergies, but I think it's very difficult. There aren't a lot of existing pathways to do that. Okay. Um, another question we had was um, the, the AICP exam is coming up. Um, the material covered continues to reinforce uh, narratives of segregation and underdevelopment that continue to traumatize our communities. Um, can you imagine a time the, the exam will be will more accurately reflect and measure the knowledge and experience that will be needed um, to have equitable um, and ethical planners and educators? So just, I guess the question was about the AIP, you know, can we make a more eth ethical and um, more equitable AICP exam? I think so. And I think a lot of the divisions, the women's division, a lot of the different divisions have really been pushing for these changes. I do feel like the, the bar to get a lot of these changes done is very high and very unclear because I do feel like once again, a lot of us out in the field are like, this makes absolutely no sense. No one has used this in a thousand years. And if you did use it, you'd probably get sued. So I think kind of once again, how do practitioners actually communicate with APA about this? And I'm wondering, once again, is this something with the local chapters, but some way to officially get the word to them? Because I feel like it's not clear if this is ever going to be changed or if we're really going to start including more lived experiences into the exam itself. Because I think otherwise you're really setting up planners to not be very good at their jobs if that's all you went by. Yeah, I think that the ACAP kind of operates like mostly based on the questions. So there's questions that they will stop using. <laughs> so I would say um, if you see some of those questions um, that, you know, because there were some of them were like fresh in my mind. There was like something about what is the best thing to do, like hire a Latino planner, hire a translator or do this. <laughs> Um, so it's like, I remember, you know, the question, so you can provide feedback and say, you know, what about this, this question? Um, or what about that question? Um, I think that that's like very clear and specific, um, guidance. And then some questions get dropped and new questions are being added and questions are, um, um also tested over time. So that might be like a very good way of like providing feedback. Great. Um, another question that uh, we had was uh, one person stated that um, their planning organization says they have uh, trouble uh, reaching out to uh, candidates of color. Like, are there any, uh, what's the best way for planning departments to increase the number of 
of uh, planners of colors for their departments. I think one of the, oh, I'm sorry. Did you want to go? Okay. Uh, I was just going to say, I think one of the fantastic things as a planning agency that we have done is working with local community colleges. That has been really, really huge for us. And pulling, like I said, from existing communities of different disciplines to kind of bring them in. Because I think quite honestly, if you don't do a combination of both, at least for us on the East Coast, we're never going to get to the numbers we need. We have to go outside of our usual bounds. And I just think the connections with the academic institutions are huge. That is the biggest thing we can do. Yeah, and I, I would just co-sign on that. Um, again, I know I represent an HBCU, but I really do. I mean, that is a clear direct pipeline, you know, getting our graduates into your planning uh, department. It's one-to-one. -one. I was speaking about um, academia. Uh, one of the questions we also had, and just maybe time for one or two more questions after this, uh, what can be done to increase the number of black faculty members? I mean, I know we spoke about, at length uh, about that, but. I think that, you know, it's a, I think the um, appointment, promotion, and tenure requirements have to be reevaluated because, as I said before, and this was my experience, uh, so it's been maybe 10 years or so from, you know, when I was, well, it's only been five years since I've been out of planning, I could the planning academy, but if we don't have people, we had a lot of people uh, coming out of, you know, top planning schools for doctoral programs, but if they're not, if they're getting on the tenure track and not getting tenure, then that's, that's a big problem. And I think it really goes back to, like I said, evaluating the appointment, promotion, and tenure requirements. Um, our publications, you know, top should that be I guess weighting everything uh, in terms of the criteria that faculty are evaluated on um, I think we have to revisit it and just like we talked about mentorship for students uh, junior faculty need that mentorship as well and, and not and not only just through like APA and ACSP because again I think Eva's talked about the fact that we have um, the, the junior faculty of color, uh, program and we also have through um, um, planners of color um, mentoring as well. So that's great, but that's like an add-on and extra. It needs to be institutionalized, built in at in, at the department level, maybe the school level, but definitely you know at the department level where they could connect it with mentors. I mean, you trying to figure out the tenure process all by yourself. That's a job in and of itself. Mm -hmm. And the tenure process at your institution may be very different than at another institution. Um, but this isn't really related, but um, for uh, educators as well as practitioners, I think it's really important to be nominated for the, the, the PAB, the Planning Accreditation Board Site Visitors Pool. And, uh, you know, my experience on, I think I was on four or five different teams, is that, you know, there are two educators and then a practitioner. And I always like to be on those, those visits because I got to go to places that I wasn't familiar with. So East, East, uh, Eastern Washington University was an amazing experience for not a number of uh, reasons. But then, you know, you get to see what other schools are doing. You get to see other uh, uh, communities uh, that the planners are teaching and planners are working in, uh, planner, uh, planning faculty in particular. And so I encourage you to look into that. Um, I, believe, I believe it's a nomination process. Somebody has to submit your name, but, um, and there's, I'm sure, criteria that you have to meet. But I think it's an important role that both practitioners and uh, educators can can play in whether our programs, planning programs, are accredited or not. Yeah, and I I look into that, um, and you have to be like uh, 
a professor, right? So that's like, you can actually self-nominate um, yourself, but of like 133 people that are currently in the list, like um, four are African-Americans, four are, um, are Latinos. So again, there's not um, a lot of people um, there. So I agree, more, more people have to volunteer but for that. We also have to have the, the number in, in professors to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. All right, I think we have time for one more question. Um, I thought this question was really interesting. Um, how can programs implement mental health in the, in the curriculum? Uh, marginalized communities are often highly susceptible of mental health issues based on their environment. I mean, I think that can be done and we see it right now, particularly with um, some of the challenges that have happened as a result of COVID of the pandemic is uh, really just incorporating concepts around health. And so, and, you know, fundamentally for many, you know, planning agencies, your the, 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 the foundation of your work is to promote the health, safety and welfare of the, the people that you're serving. And so really thinking about, and so one as planners, I think that has to be learning more about health. So whether that be taking additional classes in the School of Public Health, uh, you know, working with, um, working with uh, uh, maybe a, a providers, healthcare providers, and thinking about the mental health aspect of the built environment and, and really bringing that to the, to the forefront and uh, in really incorporating courses, coursework on that. Um, one of my professors at the University of Maryland focuses on landscape architecture and the role of landscape architecture in mental health. And so for us, it has been um, at, the, at our agency, at the agency level, how can we invite more planners who are even though she's not technically a planner, right? So a landscape architect, how do we invite her to our agency to have conversations with us about here is how planning impacts mental health and, uh, and mental, mental health. And also here are some solutions that you all can use to integrate this in your, the design of your communities or in your master planning process, or when you're thinking about the develop, development review, here's how you can incorporate that. While then also from the, the academic perspective, how are we then, is it, if I am right now not the expert in that topic, am I building the relationships with those other experts so that they can serve as guest lecturers to then talk about that in, in, in my class? So I think it would it would be even at minimum just having a, a day in a in a planning course or a community development course or a studio that focuses on the relationship between uh, planning health and well-being. Great, uh, thank you for that. Um, so a lot of the questions were kind of similar, kind of already addressed. Uh, that kind of wraps up some of the questions. I didn't, I wanted to give all the panelists um, just one last shot if they had any parting thoughts before we conclude. I, mean, I, do. <laughs> okay. I do wanna just really highlight the, uh, the role of a youth engagement in thinking about equity. So ultimately the communities that we're planning for are for uh, young people. So if our plans take 20, you know, 20 years in the future, those are gonna be like the young people of today. So how do we incorporate them into the process? And through some of my experiences in working with the youth in uh, Prince George's County, um, I mean, they're, they're planners by nature. They understand the built environment, they want communities that are more walkable so that they can go hang out with their friends. They want communities that are more bikeable. They wanna be able to, to access these different amenities. So really starting to have some conversations with them, I think is, is ultimately, uh, is, is very key. And I think can uh, truly transform our perspectives um, as, as uh, practitioners. I agree with that. Uh, I just, yeah, I just want to agree with that. And I think it's really the integration of the community and getting out in the community as planners, because I think, you know, as Brittany said, I've learned more from working with youth on these community plans than really anyone else, because they see things that we don't see and they operate at a speed that allow them to truly experience a community. So they, they're not just kind of the future. They really are, are now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I wanted to add on the importance of community engagement. So Hazel was talking about like revising the guidelines for tenure. And I know of like some programs that have tried to emphasize um, community engagement as a, 
a way of um, a kind of work that it could help you to get um, tenure. And uh, I think that also the, a lot of the students, like when they talk about, oh, I was like exposed to working with like, people from diverse backgrounds. And actually, you know, we were talking about this thing in like planning theory, but I really didn't get it right <laughs> until I, I went over there and I was like working with um, with the community um, and like how, how to collaborate and all these like ways of like practicing um, planning um actually are more like evident when you're like working um with with communities um and at the at the same time um it is a way for planning schools to provide services to communities that might be low income or uh, might be underrepresented in the political process uh, or even underserved by by the cities that they um live in um so i, I think that more commitment to community engagement, it can help us to achieve uh, many of these goals, including creating um, pathways to higher education. Because like when we go to communities, as like Brittany and Monica talked about, we interact with youth and our students interact with you and they are asking, well, what is, what is this thing planning, right? <laughs> um, and maybe they never been to the, to the university because it's on the other side. Um, of town, but we went to them. And um, now they know about um, the university and how exciting it could be, um, to be to be a planner. So again, that's a way that we um, make that, that pathways. And I would also um, just wanna keep the spotlight on when we're talking about equity and planning given that HBCUs are graduating many um, planners of color, it is important, I mean, it is not just because I work at an HBCU, but it is really important to make sure that the last remaining four programs uh, stay strong. And, you know, if there's something that, I don't know, if ACSP, I know we have like um, Committee on Diversity or one of the other committees, that if a planning program, particularly at HBCU, is having some issues or maybe even um, you know, at the brink of closure, like way before that kind of happens, that there's a conversation of ways in which we as a um, professional society could help. And I, and I don't know exactly what that help might look like, even if it's just, you know, helping them think through a process to, so they can stay open or something like that. Um, because we're, we're down to just four. And so we, we definitely don't want to see any of those four close. And if there was any way possible to maybe reopen some of the ones that have closed, that would be phenomenal. And Dr. Edwards, did you have any final thoughts before we close? Um, I, I think that, yeah, <laughs> I, I really think that the ingredients for, you know, increasing the numbers, you're, we're, we have them, we just have to put them together. Um, I think that, you know, a lot of the things that have been discussed this evening really um, go back to networking, learning, you know, connecting with your local chapters. Uh, there was a question in the, the Q&A, you know, do Black planners even value the AICP? But how do we explore these topics further? Um, I don't know that APA is, I think over the years they have uh, given more voice to, to uh, players of, of uh, diverse planners. So planning in the black community, women, uh, women in planning and other uh, divisions, but how do we keep this conversation going at you know, the national level so that we can uh, find ways that we can implement outcomes or positive outcomes at the local level. Thank you. Um, as you can see from the chat, everyone is loving this conversation. Uh, this was an excellent panel. Uh, on behalf of the National Capital Area Chapter, I thank all of you, uh, all the panelists, um, to you, Dr. Edwards, for moderating this. Um, and we're gonna wrap up um, this, this, you know, this discussion on equity and planning uh, departments in academia. Um, thank you again to all the panelists. Uh, please stay tuned. Um,
to the National Capital Area Chapters webpage at ncac.planning.org uh, for any future events. Um, thank you all once again um, for everyone commenting and um, everyone have a good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.